So welcome to History in 10 Minutes, a video podcast or channel where we talk about history in 10 minutes or under. So to begin with, I apologize about the wind, which you can probably hear over the microphone. We are in sunny Aberystwyth, though it's quite overcast as you can see today, and it's been raining, so my hair's got a little bit wet. And we are on the top of Pendinas, which is a local hill just on the coast in Aberystwyth. So why have we come here today? Well, the answer is because we're going to talk about the concept of relativity, objectivity and subjectivity. So the question I want us to ask ourselves today is can historians be truly objective? Can our understanding of the past be truly objective? Or is everything tainted in subjectivity? Pendinas overlooks the town of Aberystwyth. It's one of three hills which encase the town. On the other side of the bay lies Constitution Hill and inland lies Penglais. So from our current view from Pendinas, we can see Penglais Hill directly ahead of us. And beneath us in the valley lies the town of Aberystwyth. As you can see, the top of Pendinas is a fairly sparse environment and it's exposed to the elements. And it's also quite a steep climb to get to the top of if you ever come to visit. So if you walk up Pendinas, there's not necessarily a great deal to see other than the Wellington Monument, which was built uh, in the 1850s in order to celebrate the Duke of Wellington, the victor of the Battle of Waterloo in 1815. And you can see the Wellington uh, Monument just over there at the top of the hill. So I said that there's not really a great deal up here on Pendinas, with the exception of the Wellington Monument. But appearances can be deceiving. It only looks that way. When was if we take another look at the hill from a different perspective? Will we see something else appear? The answer is yes. So this is Pendinas from halfway up Constitution Hill. And if you look closely, you might be able to spot some unusual rings apparently cut into the surface of the hill. This is because Pendinas was in fact the site of an Iron Age hill fort. Yet standing at the summit of the hill, you would never know. But to examine it from a different perspective, then things suddenly look very different. So perspective, the way you look at the past, its objects, its geographies, and the documents produced by its peoples, changes what you see. So in that sense, history, the product of historians, is inevitably subjective as opposed to objective because each historian will bring their own perspective, methods and pre-existing cultural assumptions to their analysis of the past. There's an important caveat that we need to make here. Subjectivity does not necessarily mean dishonesty. In fact, it doesn't mean that at all. And nor should we be confused by the word bias. Everybody is biased because everybody has their own subjective view of the past. So, having scaled Pendinas in order to construct what is perhaps a fairly crude metaphor about perspective, it's time for a cup of tea. Thankfully, Constitution Hill has a cafe. Many people assume that history is something which simply happened, that it's the past, and that if the historian or researcher is diligent enough, they can simply get at that past, that they can learn it, and that they can tell it accurately. After all, history is different from fiction. Fiction, you can simply make things up. Historians can't simply make things up. They have to do their best to tell the truth as well as they can, as honestly as they can. Because in that sense, history is empiricist, in the sense that it is built on sources, primary sources, objects, documents from the past, which the historian analyzes and tries to do so as honestly and accurately as they can. But it's still a matter of interpretation. The question of perspective really comes into this. If we look at things in a slightly different way, as historians will always do, then they will come up with a very different set of answers. For example, I could put 100 students into a room and give them 10 documents, all the same, and you'd get 100 different, slightly differing interpretations. So they'll be different, even if the student comes to the same point of view as another historian, another student historian, they will probably uh, have written it in a slightly different way because history in, the, in that sense is also about the writing of the past. It's about the presentation of that past in as coherent a manner as possible. And because writing is an art form, every single rendition of that will be slightly different. In this sense, history is different from other empirical academic disciplines. 
and by empiricism I mean knowledge which is generated through the direct observation of evidence. So how is it different from the sciences? Well, as I said, put 100 different historians into a room and ask them to solve a problem and you'll get 100 different answers. However, a properly designed and developed scientific experiment and that experiment's results should be replicable. To quote Brian A. Nosek and Timothy M. Errington, Credibility of scientific claims is established with evidence for their replicability using new data. This is distinct from retesting a claim using the same analyses and the same data, usually referred to as reproducibility or computational reproducibility, and using the same data with different analyses, usually referred to as robustness. In history, we simply can't do that. After all, this is all built on interpretation and different perspectives. Of course, there's also a crisis in the sciences at the moment, because they're finding a lot of problems with this, but science should be replicable, even if sometimes it doesn't always live up to that standard. There is no such standard in terms of history, and nor could there be. Let's say you're writing a history of the Battle of Waterloo. There's a number of different ways that you can do this. So you might, for example, want to do it from the point of view of the officers in command of the battle. So people like Lord Wellington, people like Napoleon Bonaparte. Alternatively, you might, for example, be interested in looking at this from a gendered point of view. What were the assumptions about masculinity and manly behaviour and being a good soldier which led people to behave and fight the way that they did? Alternatively, you might want to come at this from a women's history perspective. What about the wives, mothers, sisters, aunts, nieces, girlfriends? All of these people have a perspective and a, and a view on the battle at the time, and you could quite easily write about that. So the perspectives from the sources which you're addressing will influence the type of history that you're writing. And it's no coincidence that a number of different schools of historical thought emerged when they did. Really up to the 1940s, in Britain at least, historians tended to look at things like military history. They tended to look at political history. They were interested in the works of great men and how society was folded around their decisions. Yet, after the Second World War, this starts to change a little bit. So, for example, there's a book by a man called G.M. Trevelyan called English Social History, and he was interested in society itself, in English society. And then once we move into the 1950s, social history really begins to pick up. And from that you get the birth of things like labour history in the 1960s and 1970s. You also have Marxist historians who are writing around this kind of time as well. Then you have a kind of new left history. So all these different historians working on different perspectives with different politics. So that might be Marxist politics, it might be kind of the labour movement politics, trade union politics. Alternatively, you've got fairly conservative historians who are writing as well. And there's different trends and traditions which are involved in that as well. So it's also no coincidence, I think, that out of social history, but also the women's liberation movement of the 1960s and 70s, you see the rise of what we might call women's history. And one of the things that they noticed was there was a really quite substantial gap in what we might call the historiography in the literature, where people weren't really considering the role and status of women in society, or the experiences of women in society. And it's no coincidence, as I say, that this movement emerged within the historical profession at around the same time or shortly after women's liberation, so the second wave of feminism. So historians' intellectual work, their ideas, their approaches are very much the products of the society in which they live. So yes, it might be a great objective of the historian to be objective, to leave kind of wider things aside and to try to focus on explaining the facts and what they are and what they mean to audiences, to readers or to viewers, however you want to engage with your history. But we have to remember that this is produced through a subjective process. Which sources are selected? Who has produced those sources and why? These are all subjective questions. Which sources do you then choose to go and look at and to write about? And which ones do you prioritise? So that's the historian making subjective choices then as well. And some of these choices are going to be subconscious because of the society which produced them. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed. Thank you very much. Like and subscribe.